Welcome to everyone. Um, welcome to day three of our National TANF Directors Meeting. Um, I hope you found the first two, uh, two and a half days um, full of information and opportunities to visit with your colleagues. Um, we're now getting ready to start our concurrent session for today. And if you're looking for the ses se uh, session, which is entitled Sharing Program Successes, Employment Strategies, and Economic Development Opportunities That Work, then you are in the correct place. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, today's panel is comprised of success snapshots, where speakers are going to present on a range of innovative strategies um, that enable programs to link people to jobs, to better communicate and respond to participant needs, and to provide training and skills to um, skill development in the community. And speak speakers are also going to share a variety of strategies that can be used to find employment opportunities, um, including work activities that are culturally relevant and responsive to the needs of their participants. Um, and just a minute before we start, I'd like to continue with the practice of acknowledging and honoring the link between indigenous and communities and the land that we work, uh, land on which we reside, by leading in a land acknowledgement. Um, today, I'm coming to you from Lawrence, Kansas in Region 7. And Lawrence is the home of the University of Kansas. The University of Kansas occupies homelands of several different tribal nations, including the Kaw, Kickapoo, Sioux, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. We acknowledge the painful history of forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. I'd like to next move to introducing our speakers. We have a great panel for you today. Um, our first uh, speaker we'll, be, we'll hear from is Lisa Tilford. Um, she's uh, a registered dietitian with the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project. She has over 23 years um, experience in career navigation and pre-apprentice industry, as well as 23 years as a union carpenter. Um, Lisa has raised her daughter and niece on a carpenter's wages and realized apprenticeships with, uh, within carpentry was an excellent opportunity for many. And looking into this construction workforce, she noticed that were, there were few Native Americans in the construction industry and helping Native American women to enter this field um, has become her goal. So we're excited to hear more about that. Next, we're here, we're gonna hear from Wendy Hack and Kimberly um, Ninham with the Oneida Nation. Um, Wendy is the Economic Support Specialist and TANF Case Manager, and she assists clients in overcoming barriers, helping them succeed, and becoming more sufficient. She has experience in working not only with the TANF benefits, but with the state benefits. And her passion is to assist communities in need without judgment and with compassion while making difference in people's lives. Kimberly is the intake coordinator for the Oneida uh, Economic Support TANF program, and she invests time in researching resources available within the community to ensure clients receive the adequate assistance that they need. Um, and due to the COVID-19 pandemic, new and creative business practices had to be developed um, to replace those face-to-face -face contacts that were not possible. So we're going to hear more about that also. And our final panelists also are coming to us also from the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project, and they are Jessica Quinlan and Brittany Tiga. and I apologize, I hope I got that right, Brittany. Um, Jessica is the Food Sovereignty Coordinator, and she has, over 12 years, has worked in the Southwest for a variety of programs and believes that strength-based community-led initiatives are essential in supporting health. And she enjoys coordinating in school, after-school and community food sovereignty programs with the assistance of their agricultural committee and other project staff. And Brittany um, brings a strong background in some unique um, fields in the culinary arts. And she has um, amazing talent for creating Zuni traditional dishes with a modern gourmet twist. And she's, in, she's an essential part of the project's food sovereignty efforts and has brought new levels of stability and knowledge to their program. 
If you want to read more about our panelists, um, the full biography on each of our panelists can be seen, can be found on your agenda by clicking on each of the individual speakers um, um, if you go to the session on your agenda. As our presentations, um, after our presentations um, from our panelists, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and questions will be asked uh, via the chat or we're going to be using our virtual hands by raising your hands. Um, so you can enter your questions for chat at any time, but right now we're going to go ahead and start with our presentations and we're going to start off with Lisa. Thank you. Just for clarification, I am a Family Career Navigator for Terra Vocational Training Center. Thank you. Uh, I <laughs> appreciate that. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, this program started, well, I'm going to jump the gun. We hold two classes per year with currently 15. So the statistics I'm going to give you are from uh, 2019 pre-COVID. We do not travel out in the vehicle anymore because we can't put 12 people in a van based on tribal coronavirus rules. So with class, we do hold class and we hold at, we can safely hold class with 15 students. Our classes are six foot apart and we're out in the shop area. We have it blocked out in six foot square so we can safely accommodate 15 people. Um, but typically we normally have 23 to 28. Next slide, please. Terra Vocational Training Center started uh, in partnership with Edmonds Community College, apprenticeship in non-traditional employment for women and Tulalip tribes in 2001. In 2003, um, it, that 2001 was funded by Workforce Development Council in Snohomish County, and we lost the contract ended. So they took over with NACTEP grant, the NACTEP grant, and they trained um, in, in sections. And then in 2003, Terrell resumed responsibility of the, the pre-apprentice program and they changed the name to Terra Vocational Training Center because eventually they'll incorporate other trainings into the program. In 2014, we became the first Native American state recognized pre-apprenticeship. We partnered with carpenters, laborers, smith masons, sheet metal, electricians. And in 2018, we changed it to a six, it was a 14 week, changed it to 16 week. We added a couple of things has whopper training and uh, scaffold erection. And then we changed it to eight weeks and the second eight weeks are by invitation only. And I'll clarify what the criteria is to move forward. Next slide, please. PVTC offers student support services, stipends for work clothes, tools, job placement and referrals. Um, construction industry training pre-apprenticeship are the classes that we offer. Um, with Apprenticeship, you have to have a high school diploma or, um, and, uh, or a GED and driver's license. So we work on getting students to earn their high school diploma through 21 and up mostly. Uh, and we work with Renton Technical College to do that. So they earn a high school diploma by completing the program and some paperwork through Renton Technical College. And for some of our students are first time high school graduates. We, Pre-COVID offered operating engineers training for a 40-hour dozer training. Those people who were successful, then we offered CDL training and we had scaffold erection. But we haven't had scaffold erection for about a year and a half because our uh, instructor is elderly and we want to keep them safe. Next slide, please. We partner with other tribes, Washington State Department of Transportation, Washington State Apprenticeship Training Council, apprenticeship programs, Renton Technical College, South Seattle. So our students earn college credits. We alternate, Renton one, one class, the next class is South Seattle. We work with Northwest Justice Product to help them, project to help them get their uh, driver's license fines reduced to the original fine so they can realistically pay it off. Instead of paying $10,000, it's back down to the original 300. Uh, we work with Goodwill Industries and Workforce the Homish. We share resources to mac mac maximize the benefits. So they, we get support services from Washington State Department of Transportation, uh, the tribe, and a new. Next slide, please. 
The goal of the program is to enter the construction industry. Uh, natives are taking the first step to successfully enter a construction career by attending the program. They earn 28 college credits upon completion and almost every single apprenticeship gives our students preferred or direct entry into the construction industry. Next slide, please. The thing I wanna add is around Washington, the uh, current wage for apprentices to start is the average wage is $24 an hour, which is a, an excellent livable wage. And it goes up every six months with raises until you reach journey level and then you receive a raise once a year. Our students come from across the country, Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Idaho, and Washington. However, unfortunately, we do not have housing. So typically, if we have somebody come from Idaho, their tribe pays for the housing. Um, same thing with Wyoming. Next slide, please. We did the aid and aid for two reasons, I think. Um, so at the first eight weeks, they'll earn certificates. So they, if they aren't going to make it, they could at least have some certificates to be successful. And I believe they take it more seriously because they're like, how am I doing? How am I doing? Um, but a successful student focuses on work, turns in all their assignments, has good attendance. They respect self and others. They help fellow students. They follow instructions without argument. We're looking for somebody. What I'm looking for is things that make them fail on the job, trying to allevi alleviate them so they'll be successful in the construction industry. One of the things that I discovered, and I'm always incorporating things, is the phone. We had a fellow who was making $50 an hour, but he couldn't leave his phone alone and he got fired. So now I have a shoe rack hanging on the classroom door with their name on it. And everybody puts this little plastic shoe rack. They put their phone in their assigned spot and they don't have it all day long. However, I do make exceptions. If you have an emergency, you know you have a child at home that's sick, you may have to leave and go to the doctor. Then you tell the instructor, I need to keep my phone today. Next slide. Oh, the other thing I wanna add is, they don't wake up on the ninth week and I don't call them and say, you're not coming in. They know way ahead of time. I see you're missing a lot. We need to work on that. What's going on, you know, to keep you not sleeping and so we resolve issues my thing is not to, to keep people out because i think the longer they're there the chance of the light bulb coming on is greater so i like to look at them as a worker in molding i'm molding them so with the eight and eight students take the training more seriously they come to me and say how am i doing they want to do well they want to go on to the second eight weeks 50% of the people who graduate from the program enter an apprenticeship. That's what I've noticed increased since we included the eight and eight. Um, attendance is increased. Um, high school diploma, we've had a total of 36. Um, we started this high school 21 program with Renton Technical College in 2016. We've had 36 participants earn their high school diploma. This current class has seven. So at the, upon completion, we'll have 42. Um, one year, our students had 15, and that was more high school graduates than the tribal high school. So they can um, come to our program, complete and get a job and have a high school diploma or have their driver's license retrieved. We're doing everything to prepare them to enter the construction workforce. Next slide, please. We work on uh, soft skills. They, I do an employment history record and I create the resume with that. We create a, a cover letter. We work on interviewing skills. We do mock interviewing until they hate me. And then um, they come back afterwards and say, oh my gosh, I couldn't have got that job if it wasn't for Lisa making me do the mock interviews. Uh, attendance intervention with them and with their children. So we can work as a liaison with them, in, with their school, because the, the, job, the focus is um, if you help them succeed, they will be successful for their children to see and model that behavior because children model what they see. Dependable strengths, I incorporated that because we had a woman who was so confident, everyone asked her for directions and she had an opportunity for a great job, but she didn't think she could do it. And so she didn't recognize her own dependable strengths that everybody has, it pulls on every day. So we do that the first four days. Um, 
one of the students said to me, why don't we just write down what's wrong with us and try to fix it? And I told them if I wrote down what was wrong with me, I could fill two pages. But if I could write down what was right with me, it would take me a long time to pick one thing. So it's easy to think about what you do well and, and strengthen that. So we work on dependable strengths. And I think um, it helped them gain confidence as well. With the mock interviews, I invite coordinators, I invite uh, business owners, contractors, um, tribal employers, and they actually sit in front of a six person panel and have the interview. And there's a list of questions that they have to ask. Some of them are very, very nervous and they become, we had one woman who's crying and I always tell them, just think of it as a game you're trying to win. You know, you, they always play video games. Young people play video games. It's like a video game. The more you do it, the better you get. So, um, and some people walk away with a job. Next, please. And here's, here's an example of some of the things we do. So they learn, the program is focused on carpentry. So they learn all about carpentry. And then um, we go, they learn about electrical. They learn to wire a switch, understand ground, ground oh, next slide. Ground fault protection. Uh, they wire a three-way circuit. They understand Ohm's law. And they'll be able to install basic electrical. They don't come out electrician. What I tell the students is while you're in this program, you're not gonna come out electrician. You're not gonna come out a carpenter. You're not gonna come out an iron worker. But you're gonna have an idea of what they do and how they smell. So you're smelling them. While you're there, they're smelling you. They're watching you. Are you excited? Are you motivated? Are you walking fast? So some people walk away with a job offer after going through different apprenticeships. That's what we do with our triad trade, which we haven't been able to do since COVID. Next slide, please. We would go around to up to 16 different apprenticeship programs or job sites, tour the job site, or try their hand at a different apprenticeship but we haven't been able to because of COVID. The whole staff, the Terrell Vocational Training Center staff are all vaccinated, but not all the students are, and we can't put people to bands. So we have them come to us. So the coordinator will come to us. But the reality is if they go to that training site, they feel comfortable. I don't know what it is on, on other um, reservations, but to lay up is, is large and Across, the students refer to it as across the track. So they have to cross the tracks to go into town. They really don't want to. And if we go to a job site in Seattle, they can see that the boogeyman doesn't work there because they hear horror stories. So I like them to go and smell what possible trade they could try. Next slide, please. So they go to the cement masons and they first have to hear their spiel. They talk about you know, what you're gonna learn, what it's like, and um, next slide. And then they get to pour concrete and they get to smooth it out. Um, they poured an actual permanent sidewalk at this training site. So this is the, pre this is the apprenticeship training site for Western Washington masonry trades. And they get to see what it's like. Do they like it? You know, is it fun? You know, can they see themselves doing it for a long time? Next slide. They go to the iron workers. The iron workers actually have what they call hell day, where they have to pick up rebar and move it back and forth and tie rebar. And so they go and try that for a day. They decide, do I want to do it? Do I don't want to do it? I can't quite see who's in that class to see if any of them were iron workers. Next slide. Finishing trades is a combination of three. It's um, glaziers, painters, and glaziers, painters, and gosh, why can't I think of it? Glaziers, painters, and something else. I don't know, my mind is gone. So they actually get to go try a couple of things. We take the bus and they get to see the site and walk through. Next slide. And here, they, they learned how to drill a piece for inserting a window within 130 seconds. Next slide. 
Plasters are part of the cement masons. It's, they usually work on old buildings, so they get to mix the plaster and tour the facility. You basically try making little plaster things. I think when they walk away with something too, they have a memory of that and decide if they like it or not. Next slide. So here's an example of one of the trades that comes to us. We could go over to the uh, pre-apprenticeship training for the labor or the apprenticeship training for the laborers over in Kingston, but they actually bring a truck to us and they do a test, a test dig, and then they backfill it. So the students get to try that. They really enjoy it. Next slide. And here we are at their site in, and you see it's rain, hail, sleet, or snow in the construction industry in Washington, you're going to work. And so we had to go to the training site in the rain. Next slide. Oh, that gentleman, he entered the laborer's apprenticeship. He's using that jumping jack. Next slide. The sheet metal apprenticeship, um, they come to us because we can't go to them because of COVID. So they come to us and the students build a, a metal toolbox. And it, it's unfortunate because that trade is so spanned. Like in this shot, they're doing computer, com, computer aided design. So our students get to see that there's more to this trade that they could go into designing uh, heating and air conditioning. Next slide. Pre-COVID, we, we did a youth program, and here's an example of the sheet metal boxes. So we did a youth program where the sheet metal coordinator came in and, and taught our youth, um, and it was a summer youth program that we did. And that tall young man is now currently our student for pre-apprentice program. Um, so we planted a seed with this youth. Next slide. And here's an example of um, tours. So we got to do a thing called WAVE. And with the WAVE, we go to Mount Vernon. There's like three different training sites that we went to. They go to electricians. The operators bring some equipment. The students get to smell everything for a day. And I always tell them, you know, you're smelling them. They're smelling you. Does it smell good? Do you like the way it smells? They like the way you smell. They offer you a job. We do job site tours because I want them to see people that look like them or other people doing it and know it's possible. Next slide. <laughs> Excuse me, they can visualize themselves doing the job. Next slide. We got the tour Anderson job site here on the reservation. They were building a new casino. So the student, and I think like three of our students got a job on that that building. Next slide. This is the seawall in Seattle when they were building the seawall. It was really exciting for them to be able to see what really happens on a job. Next slide. So with our certificates, they earn a forklift certificate, scissor lift, boom lift, flaggers card, first aid CPR, OSHA 10, and a 40-hour has whopper. Just got some pictures of them on boom lift. Next slide. Scissor lift, it's dark in our building. So that's our training building right there. Oh, we got new lights now though, yay. We have class speakers come in, you know, employers are always welcome to drop in. We have business agents coming in, you know, trying to encourage them uh, and graduates. I like the graduates to come back so they could see people who look like them that are successful in the industry. And they're always excited to come back and share their information. Next slide. This is Roy, he's a carpenter. He came back to tell the students about his success in the carpentry industry. Next slide. And here's a business agent, uh, two business agents, one from the painters and one from the plumbers, came to encourage our students to apply. Next slide. Now I think what everybody was interested in was our two generational approach. We have attendance and intervention, children's school attendance, safety at training at home. We talk about, you know, uh, lead abatement and how to look for lead damage paint, um, asbestos removal, mold, you know, just try nutrition, health, dental care, early learning and literacy. Uh, next slide. We have a family day so the children can actually come in 
and see what their parents have done. The first project they build is a, a bookcase and the children come in on family day and help them paint and decorate the bookcase. Next slide. We have Snow Wallop Library come in and bring books and read the children a story. Next slide. We give um, the children a toolbox. It's really a bucket with you know, information, uh, coloring books, toothbrushes, you know, a comb, different hygiene things for kids. Um, next slide. Our students get back to the community. To date, they have built 31 low-income houses for the homeless in Seattle. And that's an example of their tiny houses. Our doors are painted by one of, uh, we have a, a artist group that paints it paints on uh, different native designs on the door. So if you go to Seattle and you see one of those doors, you know our students built it. Next slide. They also assist the community if there's time. These are planter boxes that they made for the health clinic so they could grow nutritious food. And they, you know, that was for the um, diabetes, diabetes training program. Next slide. And here they started building tiny homes for the Tulalip Homeless Shelter. Next slide. Volunteer uh, cubbies early learning. They're building those little cubbies for cute little kids. It was way cute. Next slide. We have a graduation um, with their family and their children. They get to see their parents graduate. And I always say it's not over. We have a job club. We start job club. We keep them connected and motivated. We work on their resume. We uh, do more interview uh, preparation. We network with other graduates. We have employers come in and talk. I tell them they're always part of the family. They come back. I keep, I'm in constant communication. Next slide. I always say, does it work? Um, I did the statistics over the last five classes. We had 118 Native Americans enrolled. 94 graduated, 12 earned their high school diploma. This was in uh, 1999, um, through 21 and up, or not, not 19, 2019. Um, 25 entered the construction apprenticeship, 20 entered the construction industry, and 21 entered the livable wage job. The average placement rate back then was $21.04. However, 28 did not enter work, and I always say, with being in constant communication. So I've worked for Terra Vocational Training Center for six years, and I still contact everybody that I worked with from that six year point. What are you doing? What's going on when they go to work? How's the job? Are you working? Come in and talk to students if you have a day off. Um, you know, I'm in constant communication. I always tell them they're part of the family. They could come back anytime they want, update their resume, um, look for jobs. I can help them look for jobs. They enter an apprenticeship to say, how do I find a job? I tell them how to look for a job out of, off their, their page. Um, I go to work every day because I love it. I do this because I want to see people be successful. I find gratification in them coming back and see the look of pride on their face when they share their information with their fellow people. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I think we lost Karen. Um, uh, I will we will just move uh, to our next speakers, um, Wendy and Kimberly. Wendy and Kimberly, uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Wendy Hack. I'm with um, Oneida Economic Support. Um, my title is the Economic Support Specialist um, slash TANF caseworker. And I am Kimberly Nunham. I am the Intake Coordinator at Oneida Economic Support. Uh, so we are going to discuss how we incorporated social media in our uh, daily experience within our community. Uh, this cover page is our demographic information, which includes our address, as well as our website um, and other information, including our hours of operation. The Oneida Nation has declared a public health state of emergency in response to COVID-19 um, pandemic that is affecting the United States. Uh, Oneida Economic Support has been closed to the public since the pandemic began for safety of ourselves and family. On March 16th, 2020, we created the Facebook page to keep a close contact with our clients and community members. We updated our website regularly to provide quick access to our programs. And we also provided pre-fillable PDF applications to all of our programs for easy use. So currently um, our Facebook page to date, we have over 1,300 people that liked our page since creating it back in March. Um, and then also over 1,500 people that follow us as well. So this is a snippet of our Facebook page. So we have 1,000.4, I'm sorry, Yep, 1,000.4 likes on our page. Uh, this shows the ages and the female and male percentages of engagement that we receive on our page. This slide shows the top cities that view our page. Um, our main service area is Green Bay, the Oneida Reservation, uh, West Pier. Ash Wabanon, D. Pierre, Seymour, Appleton, and Howard because of our service area. As you can see, Milwaukee is also listed there. We do have an office in Milwaukee um, that assists with Oneida enrolled uh, members. Um, so here, this slide show is just a couple of um, snippets of some posts that we made. Um, just to engage and interact with the community. Um, the one on the left is um, a video that we created to talk about our um, vendor forms, which is a new process that came out um, since COVID-19 happened. We had to find out, find a different way to for clients to get um, their payments, I guess, more quickly. Um, and on the bottom, it's, it reached over 450 people and then 62 people engaged in that video. So because of the COVID restrictions, uh, an easy way for payment to be received was through these documents. However, they are very confusing. Um, along with a vendor form, which is the first one listed, they had to fill out a W-9 form and also provide bank information. Um, depending on the circumstance of who would actually receive the payment, it got to be very confusing. So we actually did a short video explaining what the documents are, why they're needed, and what to complete. So then along with the written instructions within the packet, they would understand the reason for them. Um, and then, then the next snippet um, on the right is a post that we made um, back in July, just giving our community members um, a heads up about our annual back to school assistance program that we do um, through TANF. Um, and that post actually reached over 2,900 people and then 294 people engaged um, in that post. And because of that post, because we did kind of give the community heads up, um, 
As of September 14th, we ran a report and we were able to assist 378 families with the back to school assistance. Um, and that within that, that was 841 kids. The back to school assistance we did um, was basically monies that households were used to get clothing, shoes, or school supplies for the kids this year. Mm -hmm. um, another few snippets we have here on the slide. Um, <clears throat> the one on the left, we hosted a live virtual meeting for the Oneida Nation TANF plan that we had to renew this year. So we basically were able to um, answer any questions any community members had or if they had concerns or wanted input, um, they were able to do that via this live video that we, we did on Facebook. Um, and that one reached over 240 people and then 48 people engaged in that video. The one on the right is, a, is another video that we created. So within TANF, we do offer um, our diversion services, which includes auto repair assistance for our clients. Um, so this video we created, um, his name is Brian Buck. He works for Auto Aces located in Green Bay. Um, he is very well with our pro, uh, familiar with our program. Um, so he did a video just kind of doing like a winter advice, you know, how to prep your car, how to keep it maintained for winter. Um, and this video reached over 300 people and 17 people engaged on this post as well. Um, but within our agency, we also have a WIOA, the NEW program that also offer auto repair assistance. Um, so the next one is another post that we did. Um, this was from just this past December. We assisted the Oneida Child Support Program with their Oneida Giving Tree program. And that was basically purchasing, the TAMP program was able to purchase presents and gifts for um, the community members, the families, and the kids. And that looks like it reached over 600 people and over 191 people were engaged in that post. Um, the next one um, is our, so this post is actually from July of 2020, so still kind of fresh in the pandemic, you know, people were, you know, still kind of iffy about going out into the public and um, because our agency is close to the public, another coworker of mine, um, we sat out and, you know, we socially distanced, we had our masks, we had sanitizer, but we sat out there for any community members that wanted to stop by and fill out an application for our back to school assistance or if they had questions. Um, so we made a post that day just letting community members know that, hey, we're out here, stop by. Um, TANF back to school assistance is going on right now. And yeah. yeah. So along with our post, we try to average posting within the month on our Facebook page about five to six posts just to keep engagement as well as provide information about community events as well as um, tribal other tribal department events that are in the area and explaining our programs that we offer. Uh, we've noticed that our TANF team um, receives a lot of feedback when we do live Facebook interactions. Uh, it allows the uh, community member as well as our clients to ask any questions or clear any confusion with having that direct access with the caseworkers and getting an understanding of how our program is um, or runs. As you can see, this specific live reached 1,675 people. 473 were engaged and we had a lot of shares as well as a lot of comments uh, which allowed clear dialogue. Um, along with our TANF program we do offer a lot of other programs. Um, here are the other programs that some of the programs that we offer in our agency and our department um, but we also assist with a lot of like I said community organizations. Um, with the pandemic, our tribe has offered drive-through pickups where we give out a lot of free, uh, I guess, promotional items. So a lot of organizations have given out 
backpacks, as well as water bottles, t-shirts, free lunches. Um, nothing is really needed with those drive throughs They would just have to keep safe distance, um, drive through, and receive the free merchandise from the departments. So that was really cool to see that we were able to keep engagement as well as help other departments with their drive through projects. Uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions, our department made adjustments. Uh, so our clients were very codependent for face-to-face -face interactions with the caseworkers. Um, so we had to really provide a safer alternative for our clients to allow them to have easy access to applications as well as um, other additional forms that they needed to provide to the caseworkers. So this is the reason why we provided our website pretty much on anything that we send out as well as it's on all of our applications. Let's them know that we have the applications uh, uploaded onto the website. They are all PDF documents pre-fillable. So they can email them to us directly along with pictures or screenshots of the required attachments. Also, we have pickup boxes and drop-off boxes outside of our front door. And we also added a new box for the popular application programs. Uh, where anybody can come at any time to drop off documents or pick up applications or also pick up required documents that they need to submit to their caseworker, along with the traditional mail, fax, and email options. This is our Facebook page, um, so please follow us. We do, like I said, try to up or post at least five to six times a month. Um, a lot of our posts are around our service area, but with COVID, we also do post some federal funded programs um, that people can apply for. We do realize that there are some programs that not everybody qualifies for. So to eliminate the gap, we really try to provide alternative programs that they might be eligible for. Yonko, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, um, Kimberly and Wendy. Uh, I apologize, uh, Lisa, and thank you for your presentation. I was accidentally dropped off um, of the site completely and had to, to check back in. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Jessica and Brittany. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're really excited to be here with you. It's, I know I've been looking forward to this day for quite a while now. So um, before we shared our slides, um, just wanted to reintroduce myself. I'm Jessica Quinlan. I'm the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project Food Sovereignty Coordinator. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Brittany Sialtiwa, and I'm the Food Sovereignty Specialist um, at Z the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project. <clears throat> and so um, we work a lot with the kids, and um, we've kind of gotten to the point now that before we do anything, <laughs> we pretty much always have to have an energizer or some way to, um, to get our energy out, plus the kids, of course. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I just wanted to give us a chance to um, stretch and to take some breaths. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that with you guys. So if everybody wants to either stand up in your chair, um, stay seated, whatever works for you. So um, what we like to do is just have a chance to relax, reset our brains. So um, I want everyone just to go ahead and let your shoulders relax and take in a couple of deep breaths and let it out. Awesome. Okay, so let's pretend that we're going to go outside to the garden. Pretend that you're standing outside in the garden. Go ahead and put your hands up. Start to look up and pretend that you're going to see a beautiful blue sky. Reach up and go ahead and bring your arms down to the side. 
pretend we're in the garden and there's some flies around, some bees, we're <laughs> waving a little bit. <laughs> oh man, and now we're gonna go ahead and check on our squash, check on the plants. Go ahead and bend down, touch your toes. See how the squash is coming out. Check on the corn. Just bend down. Taking a deep breath and then let it out. All right, stand up. And our very last step is go ahead and give yourself a hug. And um, that's our energizer for the day. Thank you all for, for doing that. <laughs> Of course, when we're with the kids, things can get a little more crazy in our uh, activities. So, um, like I said, we're just really thankful to be here with you today. It's a really big, um, it's not every day we get to talk with, with um, such a special group of people like yourselves. Um, and I know we're all committed to the same work of enriching our communities and, um, and doing what we can to connect resources for those that we live with and that we care about. And so our presentation today for the next um, few minutes, which I know um, we're gonna go ahead and make sure that we end on time is, we wanted to share about the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project and um, in particular, the food sovereignty work that we're doing and how this could potentially and actually does currently provide work experience training and leadership skills while meeting a community need or even just a community value something that we love and we care about and that we want more of i'm going to turn it over to my coworker Brittany, and she's going to take us through the next couple slides okay so the zuni youth enrichment project um excuse me, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was formed here in Zuni, New Mexico in 2009 for the purpose of providing enriching and resilience building activities for Zuni youth. And so here at ZYEP, our mission is to promote resilience among Zuni youth so that they will grow into strong and healthy adults who are connected with Zuni traditions. And here at ZYEP, we offer various um, programs for youth, um, physical activity. We have year-round um, activities, um, flag football, uh, basketball leagues, and soccer leagues, um, as well as Zuni traditional dancing in the schools. We also do art. Um, there's pottery internships at ZYEP, um, after-school programming, which consists of summer camp. Um, youth leadership, um, we try to incorporate the youth in um, everything we do. Um, and the food sovereignty, we're, he, we have a big program here at the ZYEP with food sovereignty. Um, we'll go more into that. Um, and the park, um, the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project facility, facility is located on the very sacred um, Zuni River um, area. And it, we provide a very safe and um, nurturing space for the youth to come and um, spend time here and participate in various activities. Um, we also manage over 50 miles of um, trails in and around the Zuni community um, for community members to um, utilize year round. Um, we also connect youth to resources um, in the community. Okay, and I will turn it to Jessica next. <laughs> All right, so everything that Brittany just told you all about, none of it would be possible. It wouldn't be possible and it wouldn't be successful without two really important, um, I guess, approaches that we're committed to, and that is being strength based and community led. So, you know, by strength based ZYP, we're always really committed to looking at what's going right, what are our strengths, who, who are our leaders of all ages, who's passionate, who's talented, who wants to jump in, and then connecting those to something that the community wants to see and that um, the community values, and making sure that community members of all ages get input and can lead these initiatives. And so whether it's you know sports coaches, art and pottery teachers, summer camp counselors, food sovereignty interns or leaders, and um, agriculture support team members, 
you know, we do our very best to, you know, post like, hey, everybody, we are now hiring who is passionate about coaching basketball and wants to give back to your community. And then we have an interview process, then we hire, then we facilitate a training. Um, and then we just continue that process every year and like build capacity and just keep strengthening, um, keep connecting everybody. And we also have really important advisory committees, agriculture, water, artist committee, youth advisory, and other community stakeholders. <clears throat> so through all this, you know, from this perspective of providing work experience, I mean, there's amazing opportunities throughout um, the program. And of course, oh my goodness, this is what I was really excited to tell you all, is we're so lucky that we have such amazing, committed, innovative partners here in ZUNI that help us to accomplish all this. And a big one is um, the ZUNI Education and Career Development Center, Z-E-C-D-C. We call it ZDAC, not sure. <laughs> I think that I've always laughed, but ZDAC, and I wanna say thank you to Bernadette Pantia. She is on this um, call with us. And she actually really helped me to present this part to you while I'm speaking. Um, very grateful to you, um, Bernadette, for helping me to present what your program does. And ZECDC is a 477 program. And that's the critical program that builds capacity in Indian country by basically integrating like all these eligible programs to support workforce development and to reduce unemployment rates. <clears throat> so ZDAC houses the TANF program. And so through um, the efforts from, from ZDAC and through Bernadette's you know, different programs, they've really been our strong partner for years. And um, especially when it comes to providing um, Zuni community members the work opportunities for summer camp counseling and sports coaching. Since 2017, ZDAC has supported wages for 53 summer camp counselors. It's incredible. Um, they've provided funding to help us with other, um, other counselors and they've compensated about 15 to 20 of our coaches for our basketball leagues. So we're really thankful for that. And um, Bernadette does say that culturally relevant activities such as food sovereignty program are allowable work activities for tribal cash assistance recipients. And projects such as these help tribal communities to maintain land farming practices in order to nurture and practice healthy relationships with Mother Earth and that this can lead families towards self-sufficiency by combating hunger and increasing access to healthy traditional foods and could turn into business development. So, you know, we were talking, me and Bernadette were talking and we were thinking, man, we have so much more to do that we could um, collaborate on and overlap and integrate um, these programs to provide more partnerships. So I'm really excited for all the collaborations thus far. Um, let me give it back to Brittany to talk about food sovereignty. <clears throat> okay, so one important way that ZYEP can connect youth to the Zuni culture is, and, um, is through food sovereignty. And so here at ZYEP, we define food sovereignty as our community's ability to grow share and be nourished by our native foods, contributing to the health of our people and continuation of our traditions. And so food sovereignty is a traditional activity here in Zuni. Um, everything we are as Zuni people uh, revolve around the agriculture um, calendar. Our calendar, our prayers, everything revolve around agriculture. And um, so we connect this by reconnecting our youth to our ancestral traditions and um, Going off of that, um, we call ourselves um, Shiwi farmers. Ashiwi meaning um, Zuni people, and Shiwi meaning one person. So that's a little bit of um, Zuni vocabulary there. <laughs> and um, next one. So here at ZYEP, we do a lot of in-school programming. Um, the picture on the top, Shiwi Zana Elementary, it's the local elementary school here in Zuni. And we do a lot of um, in-school uh, nutrition education and um, just a lot of programming in um, the elementary level. And then to the right, we have the uh, Zuni Middle School 
nutrition class and a cooking class. Um, on the bottom, we have the BIA and um, Zuni Public School District Greenhouse, where um, we have a huge involvement in that as well. Uh, and on the bottom, we have the Twin Butte Cyber Academy, and they are making some um, blue corn street tacos there. Okay, and then we have some after school programming, um, which consists of summer camp. And for the 2021 um, ZYEP summer camp, we focused our whole theme around food sovereignty and um, trying to go more in depth and explain to the youth um, what exactly it means and how we can tie it into our lives and how we're already um, supporting and doing or being food sovereign. So um, we told the kids that food sovereignty is essentially we grow it, we grow the food, we share the food, we eat the food, and then we save. So we see save, and it's just this ongoing cycle that we do. And going more in depth um, with summer camp, um, we had blue corn pancakes that we did one week. The next week we did fruit infused water followed by fruity green salad. And then the final week we did black bean burgers. And so um, we tried to incorporate um, a lot of our cultural um, importance um, to summer camp this year. So blue corn is um, a sacred plant in Zuni. And so we wanted to incorporate that with the youth. Um, fruit infused water, um, we wanted to tell the youth that um, sugary drinks are pretty poisonous for our bodies. So there's other ways that we can incorporate like um, fruits into drinking water so that we can uh, flourish just like plants. We told the students that um, our bodies are just like plants and we need um, essential nutrients and water was one of them. So we stress that importance. And then the fruity green salad, um, that came with the dehydration process of how our ancestors used to preserve food. And so um, the fruity green salad was something they could eat then and there, but we had um, kale chips and strawberry chips that we dehydrated in the sun and we gave it to them the following week, which they enjoy it with their black bean burgers. <laughs> and um, at ZYEP, we promote plant-based um, education, plant-based recipes, and so, um, all the ingredients that you see here um, were all essentially plant-based. Uh, we didn't use any animal products in there. And then um, we're also um, implementing programs through our community. So the picture that you see um, on the top right is um, in March or April, we did garden kit distributions where we did 100 garden kits to um, families which consisted of soil, seeds, and um, garden tools, um, everything that they needed to get a garden started. And um, followed by that, um, we distributed 100 um, rain harvest kits. So we had some rain barrels, 100 gallon rain barrels that we gave to the families. And then we gave um, 15 families some gutter kits um, to help uh, with rain uh, harvesting. And um, on top of that, we also hired six community members um, for agriculture, for our agriculture support team. And it was the first um, team that we've had to help with agriculture. And so these, what these members would do was um, they were technical support um, for gardening. So anytime families had questions or issues with their gardens, then they would call these individuals. And um, these individuals would do um, regular garden visits and um, regular check-ins with their families to um, make sure that they're uh, being successful with um, gardening. That being said, I will turn it over to Jessica again. Just listening to, uh, to Brittany tell you, tell you about this, it just really, it just means everything to have opportunities to encourage Zuni youth and Zuni families and to allow you know community members to lead these initiatives and infuse infuse it with their own enthusiasm their own knowledge and like make it what it should be each year and on the ag support team and our agriculture committee we all decided you know we want to approach it with that teach each other uh, teaching each other 
more about agriculture and how how to do that. And so the last um, projects that our ag support team are working on is visiting all 100. <laughs> Hopefully all 100, we're going to stop by and see everybody. And we have um, portable printers and we're taking pictures of them in their garden or with their produce, framing it and giving it to them with a label that says proud to be a shiwi farmer. And um, no matter if your garden, you know, died or no matter if it didn't turn out the way you wanted, you know, we're so proud of the kids and we want them to know that um, they're following in footsteps of many, many, many generations of farmers and that we're proud of them. Um, other areas that I know um, Bernadette Pentia, the director at ZDAC and us, we um, spoke about this. We currently have family cook nights, both virtual and in person. And there's so many opportunities for work experience, leadership, um, getting hours, and um, participating. Um, yeah, and the food is all plant-based. It's so good. The kids really love it, I will say. They do. And so that's all we had for you today. Alakwa, thank you. Um, Brittany and I are really, like I said, happy and grateful to speak with you today. And really look forward to a lot more um, opportunities to collaborate with the TANF program and other similar programs for the benefit of the community and furthering um, Zuni traditions and uplifting strengths here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica and Brittany. Um, and now we have a few minutes. Um, for questions. Um, I want to be sure and get you everyone um, out of this uh, meeting in time for the, uh, the next session. That's the user centered program improvement session that's going to start right at, at quarter after the hour. So um, I know I see that we have one question that's come up in the chat um, already. And um, Jessica, if you could uh, it's requiring, it says that you're a 501c3 or a nonprofit, um, and others are interested in, in what type of funding you have for your program. That's a great question. <laughs> um, we've got some national partners, state level um, funders, as well as local. So some of our work is funded by our um, partners, the New Mexico Department of Health, as well as SAMHSA, um, Centers for Disease Control, Native American Agriculture Fund, the Newman's Own Foundation, um, Colorado Plateau Foundation. There are probably um, 30 active grants that we just apply for and, and um, try, to, try to tell the story of what our Zuni youth and what our Zuni community is doing. So those are some of our funders. Okay, thank you. Are there others that have questions? Remember, um, you can um, ask a question by raising your hand, and um, once we call on you, we will um, ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question if you want to ask um, live or by typing a question into the chat. We will also um, be looking at for the questions as they come into chat. Well, I have a couple of questions, and I know as we were um, meeting before this presentation today, we had a lot of excitement, and I really enjoyed hearing about your different programs and things. And um, I'm just going to ask Lisa, uh, what is the one thing that excites you about getting up and going to work every morning? In talking with you, I heard a lot of excitement and enthusiasm um, as you um, about your work. Well, currently we're in the third week. I just like what I do. You know, I like, I, I enjoy seeing the students pride in their face when they complete a project. I enjoy, I enjoy them. I enjoy the graduates who come back. I love my coworkers, my super, I have, I, I don't know, I say supervisors because there's a tarot director who is, um, Tori Chuckle Masket, and she's amazing. And then we have a tarot manager, Robert. I mean, we all get along. It's like we laugh a lot and we're happy, even though we're separated. Like right now I'm in the admin building, but I'm the training site is down the road. 
So it's six miles down the road. So we don't see each other a lot, but I do have a, a coworker, Jared, and the instructor knows that natives are visual learners. I'm just, everybody, it's like we're a well-oiled machine that fit together like two hands holding. And we're all there for the support of the students to be successful and graduate. I just love seeing them come back and seeing the pride in their face and the confidence they build when they go to work. I just love my job. Happy Thank to go to work. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and one of the things I, I saw in Kimberly and Wendy's presentation as far as their use of social media. Um, could you um, just touch a little bit more on all of the community context and the, and the community? Uh, it not, it's not only reaching your TANF uh, recipients, but also the community in general with, with so much that you're providing there. Is there anything else you'd like to share about that? Right. Um, so, Wendy had a step away. She's doing another presentation soon. But uh, as far as our um, community, our reservation kind of is a part of two different county areas, along with near a big city, Green Bay in Wisconsin. So Brown County and Outagamie are our main service areas for the TNF program. Um, however, with Oneida enrollment, um, if you are in a federally recognized tribe but live on the Oneida Nation Reservation, you would still be eligible or able to apply for the TANF program. Um, so with that being said, we have noticed a lot of um, frustration, especially during COVID, with people who may not qualify, who might be overqualified or over income, uh, or out of the service area. So we try to provide as many other resources available on our social media to allow others who may in the past um, just depend on our tribally funded programs or the programs that we offer at our agency, but to give the opportunity about other programs that are in the area, especially programs that have recently received more funding, uh, specifically CARES funding from the government that may have a better chance and opportunity to receive those type of services. Thank you. And I've got about two minutes left before we need to move on to our evaluation and our quick poll that we also want to complete before you go on to the next session. Um, Lisa, how long did it take you to recruit work sites and, and how is the cost of these sites offset? The cost of these sites offset. I don't know what that means, the cost of these sites offset. Well, I don't know if Patricia, Patricia wants to get on and, and clarify more on that, but as far as how long did it take you to recruit the sites? Well, it's Talk pretty about easy. many sites. <laughs> it's pretty easy. I mean, I was in the construction industry. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. I'll call them up and say, hey, my name is Lisa. I'm a Terrible Vocational Training Center, blah, 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 and we'd like to tour your site. I talked to a supervisor, a foreman, I call that company and they'll, you know, look it up and say, oh, you need to call so-and-so and I'll call them and introduce myself. So the worker's salary shared by the site. Oh, we, we are, I, I'm paid um, through a contract. Um, so is my coworker. We have a contract with Washington State Department of Transportation um, to train 60 students for two years. So my, my wage is paid for that. I'm strictly contract. My coworker and or my my supervisor is paid through Taro, so uh, that's that's Taro. I'm not sure how it's paid for Taro, but um, and the the tribe gives us a van to drive if we have to go anywhere. So um, it's all comes from different funding. So the students receive a stipend, and that comes from a charitable foundation, which I write a grant for. Charitable. I'm also do the grant writing, so I write it. A grant for, for the charitable foundation for stipends and food and you know tools, work clothes, whatever we may need. Um, so it comes from a series of pools of money that I dig up. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. And I know we have some other questions. I'm going to stop there and we didn't get your questions answered. Please reach out to us and we will connect you with um, these folks um, so you can have further discussions um, if you would like. Um, to talk I want to just more. Thank, go ahead. 
this is attached somewhere, right? My right. Uh, That's correct. Your guide has my yes. phone number and email. So people have questions, feel free to email me. And I want to thank everybody for um, joining us this today, and thank you again to, to the presenters for sharing information and being available for any maybe follow up questions that others have. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, we would like to before you move out of this session, please take a minute and um, click the link and complete the short um, survey uh, regarding survey evaluation um, and also take a quick moment to um, answer the poll. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day.